Well, today is the last Sunday after Epiphany. According to the Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary and Thesaurus, Epiphany is a Christian holiday that celebrates the revelation of the baby Jesus to the world. In this season of Epiphany, we continually look at how Jesus is revealed to us as the Son of God. And today, we probably see one of the greatest displays of that revelation here on Transfiguration Sunday. The transfiguration of our Lord Jesus. It has a mystic quality to it. Jesus is on the mountaintop, and all of a sudden, his clothes become dazzling white. Appearing next to him are Moses and Elijah. These individuals have been gone for centuries. And now, here they are standing next to Jesus. As real as a person can be standing next to you and me. We can get bogged down as to the details of why Moses and Elijah appeared next to Jesus. We could discuss the symbolism of those two figures and how Moses represents the law in the Jewish tradition and Elijah represents the prophets. We could get into the idea that these two men in Jewish tradition were the individuals that would appear as a prelude to the end of times. We could discuss how the transfiguration of Jesus reveals the divine nature of Jesus to the world. But maybe this Sunday, we will forego diving into the details of Jesus' transfiguration and just focus our attention to one aspect of this revelation. To do this, it's time to walk alongside one of the most relatable figures in our story, Peter. Let's listen to Peter's story from, well, my perspective of Peter himself. So, what has my life been like following Jesus? It's been crazy. It's been adventurous. It's kind of hard to describe. Well, let me take you back to the beginning when I first met Jesus. My brother Andrew and I were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. We had just finished our day of work. We were putting our nets away when all of a sudden this guy came up and asked us to follow him. He told us that we would be fishers of men. There was something about him, something about the way he talked, something about the way he walked that was different from anybody else we had encountered. Andrew and I decided to follow him and see what he was really about. Well, we met James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and soon we became close friends. We watched Jesus cast out unclean spirits. He even came to my mother-in-law's house and healed her. He cleansed lepers and paralytic people. He healed individuals whose hands didn't work. He taught us in parables and began explaining to us what the, the parables meant. Well, it wasn't long after that that I became convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. When he asked us who we thought he was, I couldn't help it. I spoke boldly and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus told me I was right, and he began to tell us about how he was going to die and then be raised again. Well, I wasn't having any of that. I told him I was not, that was not going to happen. Well, Jesus had some pretty strong words for me. But he never stopped loving me. Six days later, he invited me, John, and James to walk with him at the Mount of Olives. And we did. It was a beautiful morning. I was enjoying the scenery when all of a sudden something happened. It's hard to describe. Jesus' clothes became so bright, it was hard to see. He was radiating light. Moses and Elijah were standing next to him. I thought to myself, maybe this is the end times the prophets were telling us about. James, John, and I, were, we were scared out of our minds. The only thing I could think of was to ask Jesus if he wanted us to build him, Elijah, and Moses some places to stay. Then there was this voice. It sounded like thunder. 
It was God saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And just as quickly as this event started, it was over. Jesus looked exactly like always. Moses and Elijah were gone. God revealed Jesus to Peter, James, and John. As far as we know, this is the first time God revealed who Jesus was to somebody other than Jesus himself. God spoke, this is my beloved son, hear him. These words God spoke are almost identical to the words he spoke at Jesus' baptism. The thing is, we don't actually know who was present at Jesus' baptism. Our minds imagine a crowd around the River Jordan witnessing Jesus come out of the water with a dove landing on his head. We imagine the crowd all around hearing the voice of God declaring, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But the reality is, it may have been just Jesus and John the Baptist together. God's word, words may have only been heard by Jesus himself. We just don't know. This is my beloved son. Another way this phrase could be read is, this is my son, the beloved. The Greek word here, used here, is agapetos. Agapetos rises from the word agape, or love. Love is an incredibly unique word that, unfortunately, our English language does not do justice. In the Greek, the word love is represented with multiple words, each word describing a different meaning of love. However, when we read the word love in our translations, the true power of that word can get confused, and ultimately, its meaning is lost. Agape refers to a love that is unconditional. It is a love that seeks the benefit of others solely. Jesus is the manifestation of God's agape. John 3.16 says, For God so loved, or agape, the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. In Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 8, we read, But God proves his love, his agape for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God calls Jesus agapetos, the beloved. God calls us agapetos. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he greets the Christians of Rome by saying, to all God's beloved agapetos in Rome, we are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Do you feel like God's beloved? It's easy to lose sight of God's love as we go through our lives day by day, especially right now. We grow increasingly isolated every day. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic and the quarantining and the limiting of groups to, in order to stop the spread of the virus. Why does it feel like everyone is against us? Maybe it's because we love ourselves too much. Mm. And we open ourselves up to love others if they are just like us. This is not agape. This is not how we live into our identity as agapeos. From 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, we read, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent him and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love, or may I say, agape one another. 
No one has seen God. But if we love or agape one another, God lives in us. And his love, his agape, is perfected in us. God announces at the mount, on the top of the Mount of Olives, this is my son, the beloved, hear him. God's revelation to Peter, James, and John is also our epiphany. This is my son, the beloved, hear him. Jesus tells us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mark 12. This is agape. On this Transfiguration Sunday, it is very easy to agree and to go along with what God is saying. Like Peter, James, and John, we are in the presence of God transfigured before our very eyes. But like in the story, as quickly as Jesus is transfigured, the event was also over. Jesus appeared exactly as he did in the beginning. They descended from the mountain back to everyday life with the challenge to live out the truth that was, re that was revealed to them. When we leave our time of worship, we will continue to live our lives day to day. How can we feel like we are God's agapetos? We practice agape to everyone. Listen to this familiar passage from 1 Corinthians on love. But instead of using the word love, hear it using agape. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. Agape is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Agape does not insist on its own way. Agape is not irritable or resentful. Agape does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Agape bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Our descent from the Mount of Olives with Jesus mirrors our walk with Jesus into the season of Lent. It is traditional during this time for us to give up something or add faith practices to help us focus on Christ and his sacrifice. This year, I would like to challenge myself and also you to perhaps focus on something different. In 1 John 3, 16, it says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Our society has never been more divided. God showed us his agape. God removed all the obstacles so he could be with us. As we journey towards the cross this Lent season, it's time to ask God to remove from us the barriers of greed, selfishness, self-centeredness, and hatred, so that we can learn how to agape. God's agape through us can heal this aching world. Maybe by practicing agape, we will finally live into our identity of Agapetos, the Beloved. Amen.